How can we after lunch? The next session chaired by Andrzej Wypustek. And I have nothing else to do. I to go back to the rear of the hall. And that's my boss. Thank you very much. So I think we should do it now. Uh, so starting our new session. Uh, and again, we have three, spe three speakers. And uh, again, the common thread will be this Greek. Uh, Greek history, Greek culture. Starting two first papers, two first talks will deal with, with probably art, well, archaeolo archaeology yeah. and uh, <laughs> art, art. The third one will be empire. So, a variety, a variety of issues, uh, exciting uh, variety, good for after lunch time. So uh, to keep to keep us uh, up and up and running. And we will start with um, Agata. We will talk by Agata Twa from University of Rostov, a multiple punchman in Hellenistic sculpture. So please. Ooh. There's a second, please, but there is a, some problem with uh, um, equipment. Have you started? I can't read Polish. Sorry. Why don't you focus on that? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Can you focus on that? Can you focus on that? Is there a timer? The timer is there. Where do I focus on that? Here. Here is the space. 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 Ancient Greek believed that acting against divine and human laws always entails a punishment. Talking about gods with disrespect or contempt and neglecting of their worship also aroused a divine wrath. In Greek mythology, uh, there are a lot of descriptions of people punished for committing an offense. The punishment was seen as an act of revenge, recompense or appeasement. It's not surprising, therefore, that Greek art illustrating many mythological episodes also contains depictions of punishing of offenders. Although in archaic and classical periods, this topic appears mainly in base painting and in a very mitigated form. This is only Hellenistic art that brings a change. In the Hellenistic period, several groves were carved, preserved almost exclusively in Roman copies that put the spotlight on the tragic fate of mortals as the result of the omission or outrage of the gods. They represent dramatic and pathetic trend in Hellenistic sculpture, commonly referred to as Hellenistic Baroque, very well reflecting the dream of victims and the cruelty of executioners. <coughs> I'm going to start with the monument that stands on the border between classical and Hellenistic eras, the well-preserved Choragic monument of Lysicrates. It dates back to about 330 BC, but according to Brunius Sismondo Ridgeway, it should already be counted to Hellenistic era. The monument is located at Athens, at the former Tripod Street, where there were many similar monuments. The round monument, made of white pentelic marble, is decorated with six Corinthian semicolons and a frieze with bas relief decoration above them. In this uh, place. The frieze circling around the monument depicts the, the well-known mythological story, a uh, mythological story in which uh, Dionysus, Greek god of wine and vegetation, punishes Tyrian pirates, turning them into dolphins. It is most likely the first such approach to, to this myth in Greek art. The pirates from the Italian region of Tyrrhenia captured Dionysus as he traveled among the islands of the Greek Aegean. They planned to violate the pretty young man and then sell him into slavery, despite the warnings of their salesman who recognized him as a god. In anger, Dionysus filled their ship with spreading wines and phantom beasts, and when the pirates leapt into the sea, transferred them into dolphins. Dionysus, Dionysus is shown in the center of the composition in this place. In the center uh, um, 
of the composition playing with a panther and holding a ball in his right hand. On both his sides, his companions, satyrs, are carved. Those closest to God sit or approach the craters. The others struggle with pirates. Further, we can see that seemingly indifferent God joins the fight and subsequently turn pirate, turns pirates into dolphins. You can see this moment here and, uh, and here. The motive of divine punishment is without a doubt the theme of the famous Niobids, a large grove that is today best represented by replicas in Florence and Vatican, depicting children of Niobe fleeing from the arrows of Apollo and Artemis. Original sculptures formed once a grove which most likely decorated a pediment of a temple. Its central part was a statue of Niobe trying to protect her youngest child. Niobe was the daughter of Tantal and Tegete, one of the Pleiades, and the wife of Amphion, king of Thebes. She was very proud because of having a large number of children, seven daughters and seven sons, according to the Hellenistic tradition. She boasted that she was more deserving of adulation than Titanite Leto, who had given birth only to Apollo and Artemis. Hearing this, Leto felt insulted and asked her children to be avenged. To punish Niobe's arrogance and to avenge Leto's honor, her son and daughter, both powerful divinities, joined their forces and slight all of Niobe's children. The act carried out by the divine twins was dictated by love for their mother. This horrific massacre was portrayed in Greek art already in archaic and classical periods, but pathos and violence of the event is best conveyed by Hellenistic works. The most poignant is the image of mother hugging her dying daughter. With her left hand, she stretches her robe over the girl's head in the vain hope of protecting her. Niobe, once defiant, is already defeated. She looks up imploringly as if begging for mercy. To the group, a beautiful statue of Chiaramonti Niobit, now in Vatican, also belonged. Preserved without a head, it shows a girl running to the right. Her quick run is emphasized by dynamic and expressive treatment of her garments. On the basis of comparisons with late Attic gravestones and other works in Rome, the original Niobids have been dated to the 320s, what makes them an early Hellenistic composition. A moralizing, a moralizing intent could be behind the original of the punishment of Marcius, a work dated to the late 3rd century BC, known from many Roman copies showing the satyr awaiting his demise. He is shown hanging from the tree with arms bound above his head, waiting helplessly to be flayed by the brutish slave. The fate of Marcius was depicted in Greek art in earlier periods. As examples, two works may be cited. The Grove of Athena and Marcius by famous, by, by famous 5th century BC sculpture Myron, showing only the music contest between Athena and Marcius, or the base from Mantinea attributed to Praxiteles that shows preparing to punish the satyr. But the details of the torture have never been depicted so explicitly before. In this Hellenistic work, the realism is undoubtedly the most striking. The body of Marcius is an excellent anatomic study. The pose in which he was depicted causes an unusual muscle tension, which is perfectly shown. Satyr's muscles seem to be agonizingly stretched his face expresses suffering. Beside the satyr, we can see a crouching, a crouching Scythian sharpening a knife in preparation for the flaying. It is a punishment for satyr's hubris in challenging Apollo to a music contest. The victim and the executioner were probably accompanied by a third figure belonged to the group, that is Apollo playing the lyre and assisting and they comply with the cruel judgment of the gods for two bold musicians. Apollo, like his sister and the other gods, could not stand an audacity of others and cruelly punished for it. 
Such was the fate of the satyr, tied to a tree and flayed alive. The witness of the music contest resulting in such terrible punishment was to be the king of Phrygia, Midas, who spoke, not Asket, in favor of the satyr. Apollo, in rage, also punished Midas. He made the king have grown donkey's ears. A very good illustration of the discussed issue is the Laocon group, a Roman copy of the Hellenistic original dated to about 200 BC, representing the punishment of the Trojan priest Laocon for blasphemy against the god. According to Greek mythology, he was the priest of Apollo who offended the god by breaking his oath of celibacy and begetting children. While preparing to sacrifice Paul on the altar of the god Poseidon, he and his two sons were crushed to death by two huge sea serpents sent by Apollo. The second, much better known reason for his punishment was that he had warned the Trojans against accepting the wooden horse left by the Greeks. The grove, which represents the dramatic and pathetic trend in Hellenistic sculpture, depicts the scene at the altar, the moment of enforcement of the sentence. Laocon vainly tries to free himself from the deadly grip of the serpent. His head is strongly folded back, every part of his body straining, his mouth open in a scream of agony. His face expresses pain, anguish, and consciousness of doom. His other son, his other son, It is this uh, uh, sculpture, uh, still less embraced in the coils, has to look at his anguished father and listen to his screams. Another big Hellenistic group of pyramidal composition and dramatic expression, the punishment of Dirka, attributed to the mid second century BC and known from a Roman copy called the Farnese Bow shows a punishment not as a divine, but a human revenge taken by sons for an ill treatment inflicted on their mother. Antiope in Greek legend was the mother by the god Zeus of the twins Amphion and Zetos. She was persecuted by the queen of Thebes, Dirke. Her sons avenged her by killing her pussier. They tied Dirke to a raging bull and this event, the moment of punishing is shown in the discussed grove that consisted of a bull, Amphion, Zetos, and the unfortunate victim, Dirke, being tied to the horns of the huge animal. A figure of Antiope, a figure of uh, Antiope, has been added in the Roman copy. The Greek original did not contain this element. The group combines violence and power, uh, and power, and as already shown groups, refers to the death and suffering. Traumatic expression and rapid movement clearly visible in the group are typical for so-called Hellenistic Baroque, a flamboyant and very pathetic trend in Hellenistic art also represented by already discussed works, the punishing of Marcius and the Laocon group. The theme was later, was later willingly repeated as evidenced by numerous copies and sculptural transformations from Roman times, one of them dated to the Severan period you may see in the picture. It is also present in other fields of art such as relief, painting and glyptic. The freeing from a punishment is shown in the grove of Prometheus with Heracles releasing him a peculiar composition which should count as a relief in that it was anchored to, to a background, yet its component figures were worked in the round. Prometheus was a titan who stole fire from Olympus for the benefit of humanity against the will of Zeus. As punishment which Prometheus would endure for this act, he was chained to the peak of Mount Caucasus, a gigantic eagle, a, gigant uh, a gigantic eagle sent by Zeus fed on daily his liver, which regenerated by night due to his immortality. Many years later, 
Heracles slayed the eagle and freed Prometheus from the torment. The discussed globe shows the moment of freeing the Titan. It consists of an agonized figure of giant Prometheus, a main figure reclining on a rocky ground, traditionally identified as a personification of Mount Caucasus, where the mythological event took place, and Heracles, in the pose of shooting archer, freeing the Titan from his punishment. The figures have been interpreted as a part of relief-like composition set against the wall of the North Star of the Temenos of Athena at Pergamon. The date of the grove should be contemporary with the erection of the star around 160-150 BC. The figure of Prometheus is, part is partially recomposed from nine fragments. It stands with the arms upraised and slightly forward, and the right leg raised and bent. The musculature is accurately rendered with careful articulation of details indicating motion. The now headless naked male is fastened to what must have been a rock. A hole on his raised right leg probably served to secure eagle torturing him. The personification of Mount Caucasus rests on a wedge-shaped plinth. The body of the beardless yacht for Heracles, recomposed from six fragments, is depicted with solid, well-defined muscles, and the position of his arms suggests the pose of an archer. And another kind of punishment is the topic of a well-known group called Aphrodite with Pan and Eros, a Greek original dated to about 100 BC, showing the goddess of beauty and love uh, that appears to be about to slap Pan with her sandal for his lascivious behavior. The group consists of three figures, Aphrodite, Pan, and Eros. Aphrodite, shown in the type known as Pudica, brandishes a sandal in her raised right hand in an attempt to deter a wooer harassing her. Her left hand she holds in front of her pubic triangle, trying to cover or protect it from indiscreet intentions of the philanderer Pan. The naked goddess is rendered frontally with hair tied up by means of a scarf bound in a bow above her parting. Pan, the god of the wild shepherds and flocks with goat legs and horns and an ugly bearded face with a lateral smile, has seized her left wrist with his muscular left hand. Over the left shoulder, over the left shoulder of the goddess, we can see her winged son Eros showing as a child, shown as a child, trying to repulse the lascivious god from his mother by grasping his right horn. This humorous and picturesque theme places the composition in the so-called Hellenistic Rococo style, the trend in which themes closer to everyday life, light and graceful in the ambience are preferred. Aphrodite is threatening Pan, whose eyes are locked on the, on the sandal in her hand. He knows that she is going to punish him with a severe slap if his advances become too intrusive. Punishing with the use of a sandal was common in ancient Greece, in this way, children were usually punished at school or at home. Preserved objects of ancient Greek art provide examples of such depictions. Punishing a boy with the help of a sandal is, for instance, shown in the black figure Lekatos by the sandal spinter dated to the second quarter of the 6th century BC. Aphrodite, intending to scold the small eras in the same way, is depicted in the red figure Hydraea by the media spinter dated to the second part of the 5th century BC. In the discussed group, the goddess of love intends to apply the same method to scold the unruly horned creature. The sculptural examples cited above show that the punishment was an indispensable element in the functioning of Greek, ancient Greek society. It stemmed not only from the general sense of justice, but also a deep religiosity by which any objection to the divine will meant severe punishment of culprits. The expression of these views is Greek mythology in which the theme of punishment appears very often. The Laocon Grove 
the, Niob the Niobites, the punishment of Marcias emphasized divine punishment. Like other groups with dramatic expression, they show death and rape. Hellenistic dramatic and pathetic trend suited very well to portraying the dream of punishment and the cruelty of the gods and torturers. Greek gods, originators and guards of the earthly order, had human traits. They loved and suffered like people. They were also, like people, vindicative, envious and jealous. They could not stand arrogance in any form, in words or deeds. Gods guarded ethical and moral order, however, they were not engaged in the prevention of offenses, but only in punishing the wicked. For ancient Greeks, revenge meant a redress of imbalances in both divine and human worlds, etched through human actions. The punishment of Dirke shows just such a remedy for a human being for the harm done by another human. Corporal punishment for disobedience was used by both people and the gods as preserved objects of ancient Greek art show. The Rococo style, a completely different and much lighter in ambience trend in Hellenistic art that the grove of Aphrodite with Pan and Eros represents, very well suited to reveal a playful mood while trying to punish for unwanted wooing. Thank you so much for your attention.